Hello and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret, and we are in Psalm number 22. And we begin our study in verse 22. Father, we ask that you would add your blessing to the word that we're about to study. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we looked at the first 21 verses of Psalm 22 last time. And you might remember I told you that those 21 verses dealt with Jesus as he was suffering on the cross. They include some of the things that he said and some of the things that he prayed, things that he was feeling, the sufferings that he went through on the cross. Now as we come to verse 22, Actually, there is a separation of at least 2,000 years between verse 21 and 22. The first 21 verses dealt with Jesus on the cross. When we come to verse 22, it's Jesus at his return to earth and the setting up of his kingdom. So, with that in mind, let's read verse 22 and see what Jesus has to say. And he says, I will tell of thy name to my brethren in the midst of the congregation I will praise thee when Jesus returns and he sets up his kingdom here on earth one of the first things he will do is tell saved Jews who he refers to here as his brethren he's going to talk to them about God the Father he's going to magnify God the Father to them and he's going to tell them just how the Father answered all those prayers that he prayed while he was hanging on the cross, suffering for our sins. Verse 23 tells us what he will say. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you sons of Jacob, glorify him. And stand in awe of him, all you sons of Israel. See, he's talking to his brethren on his return. In verse 24, for he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted and he has not hid his face from him but has heard when he cried to him remember when Jesus is on the cross people gathered around him and mocked him saying well if he's the son of God let him come down from the cross let God deliver him and God did not deliver him until he paid for our sins until he died but Jesus, when he returns and sets up his kingdom, he was going to tell his brethren that God did hear his prayers. God heard all those prayers Jesus prayed during his suffering on the cross. God did not despise the cries of his son. He did not ignore the cries of his son. He did not hide his face from his son forever. It's just that evil runs its course evil must run its course just as it did with Christ but then the faithful are delivered and then they are blessed beyond their wildest dreams which will be the case with Christ and all of us in the kingdom when he returns 25 from thee comes my praise in the great congregation my vows I will pay before those who fear him the Lord Jesus Christ directs his praise and worship to God the Father. He told the Father that he would praise him and he will do it in the kingdom for all to see. And so those of us who belong to Christ, we will see God the Son, worship God the Father on earth just like people saw him pray to God the Father the first time he was here. 26. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Hold it right there talking about after Jesus returns in the kingdom that we will enjoy in our raised physical bodies there will be no poverty there will be no hunger no needs that will go unmet spiritual or physical in the last part of verse 26 those who seek him shall praise the Lord may your hearts live forever may your hearts live forever that's talking about the good, the good times 
and how they will last forever. The good times and the happiness will not be short-lived and mixed with lousy, painful times as they so often are today. When Jesus returns, in the new earth and in the new heavens, there will be everlasting good times and the good times will be better than ever. 27. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations shall worship before him. All the people on earth, which is where we will live, by the way, will remember what Jesus did on the cross for all of us. And I don't know how often we will all get together, but at some point it sure sounds as if we will meet before Jesus and thank him and worship him as a group. 28. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. And I don't know what the boundaries will be, but there will be nations on earth when Christ is here. The thing is, Jesus will rule over the nations. He will be the supreme king over all the nations of the world. They will have their rulers. But they will all be united in joyful submission to Christ also. 29. Yea, to him shall all the proud of the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, and he who cannot keep himself alive. And that's just a reference to all people. We are, we are they who go down to the dust. We are they who cannot keep ourselves alive. When our number is called, that's it. We can't keep ourselves alive no matter how much we want to try. And verse 29 reminds us that all the rulers and even the great men of the world shall submit to Christ. And all of us will. We will all bow down before him. We will all submit to him. And we will all benefit from him as well. There will be food, abundant and delicious, and spiritual food, as well as regular food. And we will be satisfied both physically and spiritually, and all because of our great King Jesus Christ and what he did for us. 30. Yea, excuse me, that was 29. Verse 30, Posterity shall serve him. Men shall tell of the Lord to the coming generation and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn that he, was, that he has wrought it. All generations will serve Christ in eternity and they will all remember how the cross of Christ saved them from hell and made it possible to enjoy what they are enjoying through all eternity. And I like the fact that it's every person with eternal life, no matter what year they were born in, no matter what year they died in, this doesn't matter. The generation gaps, if there are any at all, will be totally removed because everybody's focus will be on Jesus Christ. Psalm 23, verse 1, The Lord is my shepherd. Stop right there. The Lord is my shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd. He says that he is the good shepherd. But only those who repent and receive him are his sheep. David wrote, The Lord is my shepherd. And he was his shepherd. And he must be our shepherd as well. Our personal shepherd, not just the shepherd. Too many people who call themselves Christians know Jesus as the shepherd but not their shepherd and that's deadly because we must know him personally the last part of verse 1 the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want until a person makes Christ their Lord they will always lack something there will be a hollow spot deep down in their soul from being separated from their creator there will be a lack there will be a want but if the Lord is your shepherd and you are communing with him having fellowship with him you will not lack anything 2. He makes me lie down in green pastures and that's what a good shepherd does 
A good shepherd leads his sheep to lush pastures where they can eat all they want and then just kick back and rest in complete comfort. And that is the point here, complete comfort, contentment. God will provide all your needs, spiritual and physical needs, for as long as he wants you here. If you belong to him, if he is your shepherd, and that is a promise. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. And I don't know what, if anything, comes into your mind when you think of still waters, but still waters make me feel good. Sometimes I go down to the park very early in the morning to pray, and a lot of times it's very calm. And that always makes me feel good. When a river or lake is so calm that it looks like a sheet of glass, to me I just get a feeling that things are right. There's contentment there, and that is the issue here in verse 2, contentment. Peace and contentment. There is great contentment when you spend time with your Creator through Jesus Christ, if the Lord is your shepherd. 3. He restores my soul. Jesus restores what living in this world takes away. Living in the world, and I'm not even talking about sin. I'm just talking about living in, living in the world, doing the things that we have to do. That can be very draining, spiritually as well as physically. And spending time with Christ makes us feel good again. He restores our soul. In the last part of verse 3, He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. If Jesus is your Lord, He will give you moral direction. If Jesus is your Lord, then He is leading you so you don't have to be concerned about finding God's will. He is going to lead you in the paths of righteousness if He is your shepherd. If He is your Lord, if the Lord is your shepherd, you are in God's will. You have to be. Behind the scenes, He will direct you second by second as you allow Him to lead you morally. Everything else falls into place. For even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. <clears throat> it is possible for a good Christian to be nervous about death. The reason is simple. We've never done it before. It's brand new. Another reason, even more important, God doesn't give us dying grace until we are actually dying. God always gives us what we need, when we need it, and usually not a second before. So, it may be natural to be a little nervous about death, but any fear of death that a believer may have will vanish when they are in that situation because Christ will be there providing comfort. Now, I don't want to be alone when that time comes and I won't be alone if the Lord is my shepherd and neither will you God Christ will be there the good shepherd will be there walking us through that brand new thing that we've never done before and that's always good to have somebody walk you through something that you've never done before and he will be there walking us through our death 5 Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup overflows. My cup overflows. It speaks of having joy that's so good that it hardly makes sense. In spite of all the unpleasant things that a Christian may put up with, they can enjoy the blessings of Christ deep down in their soul and still have their cup overflow with joy that doesn't even make sense. It's so good. <clears throat> verse 6 surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and it will if the Lord is your shepherd if Christ is your Lord God's goodness and his mercy follows us through this life if Christ is our Lord 
when we sin his goodness and his mercy are there to forgive it which is why the last part of verse 6 says what it says and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and the fact that God's goodness and his mercy is so consistent that's why we will be saved in the end and it says we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and thankfully this does not mean that we're going to live in a church for all eternity if anybody has that idea they can dismiss that right off the bat because it simply means we will enjoy good times with God and good things from God forever Psalm 24 verse 1 the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof the world and those who dwell therein wherever we are whatever we have whoever we are it all belongs to God and we belong to God and God has the right to arrange or rearrange things any way he wants to because he owns it all he made it all and God has the right to arrange or rearrange people any way he wants to because he made us all and he owns us all no one has the right to say God why did you allow this or why did you put me in this situation or why did that happen or nobody has a right to question God because he is owner of all things it is his right it's that simple it's his right who are we to question God about anything Two, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers God's creative work involved putting dry land where there was once only ocean and that's exactly what happened if you go back to Genesis when God first created the earth it was just one big ocean and then he made the dry land to appear verse 3 who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place the question is who may serve God when it talks about ascending his holy hill it's talking about who is able to serve God since God owns everything including us the question isn't what can God do for us how can God serve me that's not the question the question is who among us may serve him to be served by God shouldn't even enter into our mind it would be a great privilege just to serve him for he who has clean hands and a pure heart who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully God's answer who may serve him people whose actions and words are holy people who have no idols in their life who do not have anything in their life that is more important to them than God they may serve him means this a servant of God cannot love or covet the things of this world the Bible says we cannot serve two masters five he will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from the God of his salvation only God can give a person righteousness that is good enough to make them feel or make them be righteous before him and he gives it to those who belong to Christ 6 such is the generation of those who seek him who seek the face of the God of Jacob so boils down to this those who really want God to be in charge of their life in other words those devoted to the Lord they are the ones who receive their righteousness from him and they are the ones who are able to serve him 7 lift up your heads O gates and be lifted up O ancient doors that the king of glory may come in the city gates of Jerusalem are here in a figurative way told to lift up their heads and open wide because the one who is approaching is the king of glory it is none other than God himself so stand at attention and open your gates is what is being said verse 8 who is the king of glory the Lord strong and mighty 
the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. And the picture here in these three verses is of a victorious Israelite army returning home after war. And they are returning to Jerusalem after the battle with the Ark of God in their midst, which was sometimes the case. They would take the Ark out into the war with them to symbolize God's presence. And here, the army, along with God, they are returning to the city, and everybody is just thanking, thanking God for giving them the victory. Now, tie all this, this whole psalm together here beginning with the very first verse God owns everyone God owns everything when we understand that God owns us next thing it taught those who live for him may serve him so when you understand that God owns you and everything that you have and you live for him and he is your Lord in everyday life then you are qualified to serve him and then when you serve him there is a bunch of joy involved in doing that because then you get to work side by side with God. You get to live in the presence of God. And you get to see Him do all sorts of things. And see the cycle? That's what these three verses are about, 8 through 10. The Israelite army, they understand. The Israelites, they understand that God owns them. And they are sold out to Him at this point. And so they get to serve Him. And get to work with Him. And then they see God do great things. And then they're full of joy. And that, just that, that's how that cycle kicks in. And it's a great thing. Psalm 25. To thee, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. In other words, the psalmist writes, David writes, I've put all my eggs in one basket, and God, that basket is you. I'm trusting you completely and totally nothing else so please come through for me verse 3 yea let none that wait for thee be put to shame let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous we will not always avoid trouble by trusting God and doing the right thing but we will always avoid shame by doing that we will never be disgraced. Disgrace, shame, that comes from sin. Shame and embarrassment, humiliation, that comes from sin, not serving God. You may not have everything that you want serving God, but and not everything may be perfect, but you won't experience shame. That's one thing you won't have to experience. Now, look at how he asked God for his leading. Verse 4, Make me to know thy ways, O Lord, teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me. For thou art the God of my salvation. For thee I wait all the day long. Wanting God's will. Every, every unfired Christian wants God's will. Wants to know what God's will is for them. Wants his leading. And I suppose an angel with neon arrows or something, painted signs that have arrows on them, pointing in the right direction, that would be nice to show us what God's will is but God doesn't lead that way he leads by the truth of his word and by his Holy Spirit and the more of his word you take in and the more you are in prayer the easier it will be for you to see God's spiritual road signs along the way 6 be mindful of thy mercy O Lord and of thy steadfast love for they have been from of old remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions according to thy steadfast love remember me for thy goodness sake O Lord God will forgive and even forget our past sins but chances are we will not we will not forget them chances are because many times there are after effects something that we must live with for a long time and if nothing else, it will be in our mind, and the shame of it remains. 8. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. 
God is good. He is fair. He alerts people when they start going the wrong way. The important thing is to pay attention to God's alarm and not go in the wrong direction. Verse 10. No, verse 9. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. Yeah, in other words, God will direct people who humbly submit to him and who want to be directed by him and who want truth whatever the cost may be to them personally and that's where we all must be none of us should settle for anything less than that than the attitude of I want truth and I will respond to truth no matter what that truth means to me personally no matter what it means I, what it might mean that I have to give up or I might have to change I want truth and I will submit to God as soon as he tells me what I need to do or stop doing those are the types of people that God will direct that's verse 9 he can direct people like that 10 all the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies if we follow the moral directions God gives us in scripture then even if they take us through trouble they will be what's best for us in the long run. They will lead us closer to God and that